<laughs> hey, I do want to recognize everybody that's just joining the conversation. Um, this is a pretty casual technology update happy hour. And um, uh, everybody, I'm Alan. I um, I, do, I don't know all of you, and I'm the I'm the director of uh, Virginia Clean Cities. Um, I'm really excited to to be here uh, talking about some exciting technologies. There's a lot lot going on with um, with propane, which we're going to be launching a, a renewable propane this summer, and then also with uh, electric vehicles and increasingly heavy duty EVs. I'm an electric vehicle owner myself. I own, my, this is my second EV that's a Chevrolet Bolt, but there's going to be some big old honking Ford electric vehicles uh, that we'll be hearing about, uh, hearing about today. So I'd like to introduce the former executive director of Virginia Clean Cities, Chelsea Jenkins, who moved on from this role into a role with Roush Cleantech, which is a really exciting company. And today they're making just all sorts of phenomenal research and technology progress in the areas that are of a lot of interest to Virginia fleets, which would be the vehicles that use the most imported fuel. Um, so like Virginia produces no oil, but there's all sorts of opportunities for cleaner uh, fuels and technologies to reduce emissions and also to, uh, to balance up some, um, some energy, energy costs. So uh, uh, really excited uh, about, uh, about Chelsea Jenkins and I do wanna introduce Chelsea, also a board member of Virginia Clean City. So Chelsea, uh, take it away, Chelsea. Yeah, proud board member. And I'm glad John's on the line because I was going to talk a little bit about decarbonizing propane, but he is going to be able to get into the weeds. Um, I can just high level say uh, what's happening and how excited we are about it. Um, but thanks for joining John. So I thought that I would start by showing a video because I love this video. It's a new um, one that the enterprise produced and it charges me up. And I think it kind of, it's, it, it frames uh, the discussion today and also um, is kind of tells the story of my professional journey and why I ended up with Clean Cities and now Roush and in the position that I am. So let me know if you guys can hear this or if you can't rather, I guess. is just a little taste of what we do across the enterprise. Um, and I can't tell you how many times a week that I hear Roush does that. I didn't know Roush did, did that. Um, and so I thought today it might be more useful to kind of take a step back and talk a little bit more globally about the evolution of clean tech as well as the evolution of the enterprise. And, you know, we're almost 50 years strong now, but so I, I said at the beginning, I, I love this video. It, it charges me up. Hopefully it charged you up. But I also love it because it embodies really the soul of Roush. And like I said, my own professional journey, which started ironically at James Madison University. We were talking a little bit history. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm, I still um, always root for the, the seniors here locally in Virginia Beach to choose to be a Duke. Um, every year when we hear these announcements come out. But yeah, so I, I remember in 2000 sitting in Dr. Papadakis's class as an ISAT major. Um, so I remember as a freshman 
first one to go to college in my family. I was one of those weird teenage kids that actually liked school and liked to learn, which anyone that has teenagers, which we do now, uh, you understand that that is more rare <laughs> than not just being curious and enjoying learning. So, you know, she was lecturing on energy security and she was showing this energy flow chart. And I, I literally remember that moment and I'm sitting there and she's talking about um, where all of our oil comes from domestically, internationally, and then, you know, what, what, where it flows into all the economic sectors. And it was so clear to me, right? I mean, if you look at that EIA flow chart, it's different now than it was in 2000, but transportation was a huge chunk of where all of the oil was going. And I remember thinking and looking at that chart and saying, you know, that is the problem that I'm going to solve in my lifetime and in my career. And it still is what drives me today. You know, 20 plus years later, I'm still trying to solve that problem. Uh, obviously the challenges are different than they were before, but, you know, I've learned through various lenses in my career, you know, with nonprofits, kind of looking at trying to find funding for fleet organizations and others, giving funding to organizations, um, being in business development roles, now government affairs, industry or relations, um, that uh, global problems require global solutions and we need a lot of solutions. And y'all know that um, some of the challenges and problems we're trying to solve today are enormous and very complex. And so that's why I'm so proud that I started my career at Clean Cities. And I think uh, I'm thankful that all of you are supportive. I hope you're financially supportive <laughs> of the organization. Um, I'm sure Ellen can send you a membership form if you don't have one yet. Um, but it's, you know, it's really cool to be in this industry during such a transformative and disruptive time. And I'm also super thankful I've been with Roush for 10 years now uh, and kind of seen the evolution of where we started 10 years ago and um, where we're going. And I'll, I'll go through that with you. And I'm much better at like conversation. So feel free to interrupt at any time. Uh, so at the beginning, I said, I hear every week comments about how people don't know all of the things that we do and they're surprised at the breadth and depth of the customers we have and the solutions we provide. So I wanted to kind of start and level set. We, we have a holding company called Roush Enterprises and the easiest way to think about the company is the services side of our business and the product side. And products is where you see our name. So clean tech is clearly uh, nestled under Roush Products Group. Also Roush Performance Mustang, Roush Finley Racing, uh, you know that if you're um, a high performance vehicle or a, a NASCAR fan, but then we also have this whole other side of our business called Roush Industries that's global engineering consulting services. And we have uh, customers all across the spectrum. And this is why, because we, it's easiest to think of us, think about us as kind of a mini OEM. We can take an idea that's sketched on a piece of paper, the back of a napkin, all the way th through the full product development cycle, depending on what that customer needs. So they may need help just on the front end, kind of taking that patent and idea through the engineering process, or they might come to us after they've already developed a widget or, or some software, and they need help integrating all of the other components um, and brains into that vehicle, for example. Or they might come to us after some of that has happened and they need help with manufacturing. So um, that's, that is the great thing about the company that, that Jack Roush has built over the last 50 years is that we've developed a lot of uh, capability. And so we're um, entrepreneurial and more flexible in what we can provide different customers. So a lot of what we do, we don't talk about because it is on the industry side, but it set us up really well for moving into the e-mobility and the electrification space um, because we have worked with so many different customers in the mobility world over the last few decades. So here's an example of some of our customers. I just wanted to give you guys a flavor of, you know, we do work outside of the automotive world. We work 
uh, a lot in the aerospace world. Um, uh, I heard the other day we were designing hydrogen engines for deep space travel. Didn't know that. I've been at the company 10 years. <laughs> um, and we're doing a lot in the autonomous electric space. So clean tech on the product side, this is what you physically see out in the world. And we were founded in 2006 uh, because of a PERC grant. And also a lot of folks don't, don't know that. PERC came to us and said, you know, there aren't a lot of great um, propulsion systems, propane fuel systems in the US. Would you work with us to uh, develop one for the F-150 because the F-150 is the you know top selling truck in the U.S. Well, of course, we learned that that's probably not a great fleet vehicle and we've moved on and evolved since then, but that's what started us in 06. And now fast forward to 2021 and we're, uh, we just launched Gen 5 of our um, propane fuel system and we have it in all of these products shown. So um, the three markets that I like to say we, we um, play well in is school buses. Uh, we have a relationship with Bluebird and provide their powertrain, uh, alternative powertrains for all of their buses from the very small microbirds all the way to the largest type C and type D buses. We have over 32,000 of those that we've put on the road um, since we launched that partnership, most of those being propane. We also sell into the paratransit space um, a lot of propane paratransit vehicles running around. Um, it, it's a great solution in those like environmental justice, disadvantaged community areas um, that uh, use a lot of propane. And you know, the, the more advanced solutions would, would, would be difficult to implement right now. And then we also um, sell in the commercial space. So class four to seven um, and pretty much every vocation on the propane side. And more recently we've launched the class six electric truck. I think, do we have a hand raised? Yes. Thank you for taking us through this so far, Chelsea. I had a question about the uh, electric on the school bus side. I see you're still just doing the gas. Do you think y'all will end up uh, providing electrification for the Bluebird buses like you're doing for the class six and eight vehicles? Uh, well, right now, so Cummins is the electric powertrain supplier to Bluebird. Um, currently, we do gasoline and propane and have provided CNG in the past. Uh, on the industry side, though, we do a lot of engineering for a lot of different bus companies um, on their electrified powertrain solutions. So stay tuned. You never know. <laughs> But right now, Cummins is that, that solutions provider. So that's a good question. Uh, so Roush, as some of you know, we've, and, and Jack Roush's relationships uh, with Ford is, um, makes sense because that's where he started. So we have, uh, since we were founded, pretty much married up to the Ford solution. Uh, but we also have that great relationship. We're a tier one supplier. We're a QVM, EQVM to Ford. And so from the customer's perspective, no matter what they buy from us, it's uh, a seamless solution. So they still get the Ford warranty. They can go to a Ford dealer or an independent um, service dealer and um, diagnose um, similar to how they would with their Ford products. Like I said, we, um, we have 32,000 buses on the road, but now we have almost 40,000 total uh, clean tech vehicles on the road amongst all the solutions. And that's with over 2,500 fleets. Uh, and, you know, I wanted to say that because um, there, there are a lot of new players in the mobility world. There, you hear about the SPAC deals every day in the headlines. There's all kinds of new companies that we're trying to sort through. And, and we work with a lot of them. We hope all of them are successful because like I said, we need a lot of innovative solutions to tackle some of these big problems. But the cool thing about the progress that we've made to date and us jumping into kind of that, um, looking at transportation and decarbonization with electric and even hydrogen is that we do have over 2,500 customers. We have almost 40,000 class four through seven vehicles on the road and we've been beat up a lot. <laughs> so over, you know, since 06, we've 
had to build our customer success program around, you know, real world challenges that these fleets are trying to solve as they launch new, new product solutions. And so we're taking a lot of that knowledge and then applying it to the e-mobility, the electric solutions that we're, that we're launching now. So I mentioned um, decarbonization, you know, we, we aren't just sitting and trying to sell what we can sell. We understand that there's, like I said, disruption and that we need to stay in touch with what's happening and what the market cares about and what the public cares about and what the world cares about. And as we hear every day, there's a lot of focus on decarbonization and tackling the climate crisis. And so we're working closely with the propane industry on the full life cycle of our solution. So we were the first ones to get um, ultra low NOx certification for our powertrain. Um, and we did that a few years ago. So um, our, our vehicles are very low tailpipe emissions solutions. So if that fleet is trying to, um, wants to find a cost effective solution that reduces a lot of the criteria pollutants, you know, they might have a, they might have a, um, they might be in a non-attainment area or they might care, you know, more about particulate matter because they have sensitive populations they're transporting and they can't necessarily electrify. Um, so we are, we're still working on improving our propane powertrain solution and making that as efficient as possible and as clean as possible. But then we're also working on the fuel side and, um, Folks like Suburban on the line are doing a lot of really important work to um, develop this with really smart partners and then also get it out into the supply chain and work through um, some of the, the potential questions and challenges with that. You know, I know at the very beginning when we started talking to the industry about it, there are questions about materials compatibility, right? If you put renewable propane in our existing vehicles, because in th it's the same propane molecule, it's just made a different way. Will that, you know, um, uh, impact seals or what have you? And so we worked with them to do some testing to make sure there wasn't going to be any issues. Um, and John, I don't know if you want to jump in here. There's lots of different pathways to decarbonizing propane. And I know, um, I, I know enough to be dangerous. <laughs> about my you're, you're absolutely right. There are several different paths and we're working with all of those different paths right now with suburban propane. Um, I mean, first, you know, you've got the uh, biopropane, which is a, uh, it, it's, it comes from making biodiesel and biojet fuel, which is basically refined out of fats, oils, and greases. Um, and that lowers your carbon intensity score by by more than 50%, depending on where it actually has to get transported from the source, you could be running a CI score of between 30 and 45 at the high end, uh, where traditional propane um, has got a CI score of like a 79. Um, and, and, you know, so it's, it's much, much lower carbons than even traditional propane. Then when you get into that other product that, that suburban propane has, we just uh, uh, bought 39% of Oberon fuels, which is out in California, and uh, Oberon refines uh, DME, uh, dimetric ether, um, and that's basically, I mean, just to kind of put it into, break the terms down, uh, that's refining methane into propane. So, I mean, there's a lot of people in the industry that call it dairy propane or, or something like that, but uh, the, the Structure on that is slightly different, so it does need to be blended with either a traditional propane or a uh, renewable propane. After it's blended with a traditional propane, you start getting CI scores in the single, digi single digits. And then when it's blended with a uh, renewable propane, it, it's even lower than that. So, I mean, Chelsea, you're right. There's a number of different ways to actually lower that carbon footprint with the fuel itself. And uh, from what we're seeing that all of those different fuels or different propanes are a drop in fuel for the, uh, for the motors that Roush Cleantech is actually creating today. Uh, I was just at a meeting with, uh, with Bluebird, uh, AZ bus sales and with Roush Cleantech uh, showing off the new 7.3 uh, Godzilla motor. And I love the engine, by the way, uh, it's amazing. And uh, all of those products will actually uh, 
power that engine. I don't know if that if that's what you were looking for, Chelsea, or not, but that's uh, the yeah. paths in a nutshell. <laughs> that it's like we practice, John. I love it. Um, and you know, this is I I think this is what also underscores why organizations like Clean Cities is so important because we don't believe there's one solution for all of these problems, right? I mean, there we're going to have to continue to innovate and then innovate again and then innovate again, as we've shown in the whole history of life itself, right? I mean, we've, we have a great solution, propane. It, it's saving customers a ton of money. We're continuing to work on the engines themselves and making them more efficient and cleaner. Um, but we are also working on the entire supply chain so that we can solve this, this decarbonization issue. Um, and so you can buy propane vehicles today because they are super cost effective and they're available. And we literally haven't met a commercial application class four through seven that we cannot accommodate. And then at some point when you have an, uh, uh, the availability of renewable propane and depending on you know what, to John's point, what CI score and what's available, you can put that renewable propane molecule in the same vehicle. So you don't necessarily have to wait on results and the benefit of other alternatives, um, and you know that's that's why we love and, and are still very much committed to to growing our propane share. Um, so jumping over to EV, I, I we announced this a couple of years ago, and I've been, we're now working on Gen two technology, but it is not new to us. Uh, over the last twenty or so years, we've actually been working with customers all over the world on developing. Uh, hybrid electric, hydrogen autonomous solutions. Um, and specific to vehicles, here's kind of the history of, uh, of Roush's development. So we worked on 98 with Ford on the Ranger, then moved on to the hybrid escape. Then we produced our own vehicle in 2009 called the Rev. Uh, we worked with Blink on engineering and manufacturing all of those chargers under the, under the Recovery Act. Um, in 2012, we worked with Via Motors to launch that electric truck. Uh, Google came to us before they were Waymo, and we helped them with engineering all the way through development and building those um, uh, electric autonomous vehicles. Uh, and uh, also worked with Cummins in 2017 on their Class 8 electric truck. And then in 2020, we officially launched Gen 1 of our own electric um, Ford branded product. So Gen 2 specs are here for anyone that is interested, happy to send a one pager on that, but it's on the F650 chassis, uh, payload um, opportunity is 14.5, and then it's 100 miles, and it really is 100 miles. <laughs> We've done a lot of testing to make sure it's 100 miles. Um, 150 kilowatt hour battery capacity, uh, you can get level two or DC fast charge options. Um, and charging rates 50 kilowatts at 700 volts. So we're, we're working on this F650 and all of the different iterations of that. Um, the most popular are what's shown, the put a box on it. So there's lots of box trucks running around for lots of different applications. Those are a lot of hub and spoke type, type last mile delivery applications, which is perfect for electric, as well as a stake bed. Uh, we also recently announced a partnership with First Priority Group they are a specialty vehicle manufacturer and make a lot of emergency response type vehicles. And so we're working on, uh, for example, an electrified mobile command center um, in, on that F650 chassis that I just showed. And we have a lot of other um, products kind of in the pipeline that we're working on right now. So uh, the one thing that I've realized, I wanted to show this. Uh, to you all because this is like the BEV ecosystem as we kind of see it uh, right now, which uh, what is sure to change. But, you know, we've been, we have almost 40,000 vehicles on the road, right? And 2,500 customers. We've learned a lot uh, working with our, our great fleet managers and launching new technology. And 
Electrified transportation, especially medium heavy duty is not the same as light duty. And it's, there's a, the ecosystem is larger and it's more complex. And we've also had to adapt our business model to that. So uh, within the company, just wanted to mention, we, we have, that's kind of where government affairs came from. We had never had a government affairs function in the history of the company, believe it or not. Um, in 50 years until recently. And, and that's because now customers need to understand how the government is impacting their business. And then they also need to, to find funding and incentives to help the business model work. And so um, it's, it's kind of a much larger ecosystem. It's, there's a lot of uh, parallel paths that need to be happening at the same time. And a lot of, um, within one organization, a lot more people need to be involved in kind of the deployment planning, which is fun. And also challenging at the same time. Um, so we're, you know, we're excited to kind of evolve and uh, and use all the 50 years of experience to um, to build that into kind of our new business models. I think, did someone else raise their hand? Is there a question about? Yeah, I, I was curious about the buying chain. What's the, how do I purchase those, uh, those Ralph specialty vehicles on the electric side? Do you have to buy it through a dealer or is it a direct sale? Yeah, so it's it'll be similar to how we've always managed um, products before. So yeah, it, it would be through one of our uh, authorized dealers, depending on what you were buying. So for example, the mobile command center that I mentioned, that would be purchased through First Priority Group or one of their dealers. But we also, you know, with grants and funding, sometimes have to work differently on the invoicing side. Alan and Matt know this with CMAC. <laughs> so we can also invoice directly for our part of the, the, the deal if we need to. And um, I also wanted to give a plug for the NASCAR side of our business. Um, we are just reimagining our company as a whole. I think, and we're in a very interesting time, not just in the world and politics and everything, but also as a company and um, all of the stuff we've been doing on the industry side and the mobility space is now kind of marrying up to what we're doing on the product side. And so we are, we are tackling some of these, for example, decarbonization as, um, as a company and working together um, with, with our industry's team. Um, and this is a great example of walking the walk. And um, they, they've announced that um, we're gonna be the first carbon neutral racing team. And I think I'm gonna stop there. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I know. I, I mean, I wasn't surprised, but I was surprised because as you can imagine their operation is insanely complex. <laughs> um, and so they had, in order to even get to the point of announcing that they were gonna do it, there was a lot of work on the back end to figure out how they could actually get that done. Uh, Chelsea, is this uh, supply chain impediments that we're seeing, has, how has that affected your ability to, I guess, create new products and deliver products? I mean. I've been talking to all these guys who are just having a hell of a time right now. Um, is that really affecting you guys as well? Yes. Yes. I, I mean, everything is affecting us, right? I mean, the, the pandemic and the, the microchips and that eventually trickled down to us because we have a lot of automotive customers. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it, we're thinking about it in lots of different ways. One of those is investment and, um, business planning. So you read, if you just paid attention to the headlines and, you know, how much electrification was going to happen, depending on what headline you were looking at, you'd be planning to sell, you know, 10,000 electric vehicles in two years. <laughs> and then you go back to the supply chain and you talk to our battery suppliers and you realize that that is impossible to do based on supply chain constraints. And so, yeah, it's, there are, there's a lot of 
talk happening. And then when you get down into the weeds, you know, it's just trying to sort that out and, and placing conservative bets. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I saw, well, I guess in the, 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 what, I don't know what the bill was called, but it had to do with combating China's rising, you know, uh, industry and technology development. And they're going to invest several hundred billion dollars in developing battery manufacturing in the United States and microchip manufacturing. Is that something that Roush could pursue as a company, like developing your own supply chains here, you know, to, to vertically integrate? Or is that, I don't know, that's something y'all considered? We have considered it. Um, I don't, I, I, you know, I, I have to be careful what I say. I don't know that we're necessarily going to make cells at Rouch, maybe right. at some point, but we do have a lot of flexible additive manufacturing um, within the company. And, you know, I could see um, more of the packaging um, and, you know, d depending on what industries customers needed, they, they need unique design and packaging solutions and then for us that would help us out i could see taking advantage of that yeah because yeah, to see the way the way the trend seems to be going is that basically that if it's not by america compliant then we have trouble you know utilizing all these federal programs so i mean i just i would i would hope to see more you know american-made batteries and products so we can take advantage of these billions of dollars that they're shoveling out the door <laughs> so yeah. i mean i don't you guys tell i don't know how they're going to enforce I, if they want electrification or zero emissions and right now it's being defined as electric and hydrogen if they want that to happen as aggressively as they're talking about they're gonna have to compromise right i see that side. something somebody's gonna have to bend a little bit you would think yeah, I mean, I that's where the disconnect is. It, it's a, it's a, we're swapping one national security problem for another, in my opinion. And there hasn't been a lot of discussion about it until recently, which I'm excited to hear more and more. You know, there's a few congressional hearings on the subject, and there's a couple, uh, like Advanced Energy Economy has started a campaign, Working Group CalSTART has started a, a working group campaign maybe some others, but it's, yeah, I mean, we've got to figure it out. Otherwise we're going to be in the same boat. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Chelsea, I was just thinking about some of these um, really exciting opportunities for medium duty uh, individual business operators or folks that own not 10 trucks, but own that first truck. And I know you're, thinking about that future, um, those are important workers. What, what do you see as the path for those vehicles to be able to charge or to be able to fuel up on, on propane? You know, how do we get beyond limiting those individual operators or fleets of like five vehicles uh, to gasoline and diesel? How, any, any thoughts on, or like magic, magic bullets? You, you guys have done the infrastructure to the vehicles, so. Yeah, so are you asking, you know, scaling beyond the smaller pilots? Scaling beyond smaller pilots, scaling beyond, you know, just a few vehicles at big, big fish FedEx fleets. You know, what about the individual FedEx? My FedEx guy is an individual driver. He owns his truck. He takes it back home instead of back to a, like a fleet of, of you know, what, um, and they need, they're going to need public charging. They're going to need public charging. It's not the same spot that like a little Nissan Leaf would go to, uh, but that could queue heavy duty vehicles. Yeah. Have, have you solved that? Uh, yeah, we have because we have solutions that they can buy that or you know, have liquid yeah. fuels and have, I think this is, that's the frustration we've shared, right? Is that there are, in the near term, it is going to be difficult for fleets outside of the Californias, New York's folks that are 
literally billions of dollars of state funds are going into incentive programs. And then they're also mandating fleets to purchase a certain percentage of electrified solution. Um, I, th I think it is, I, I think it is going to be difficult. I mean, there's charging continuously comes up as a challenge um, by by fleets, and you know, just the facility integration piece and the 12 to 24 month timeline for the utilities to work with the fleets to figure out how to get that much power to the facility. To I mean, yeah, it's I think the big companies with a lot of resources. The states that have a lot of money, they're going to have some early successes, but then I feel like we're going to have to reinvent the solutions and provide different ways of helping the 90% of fleets that are out there than just the cookie cutter fleets that we're talking about. Unless the incentives become a little better balanced, which is what we advocate for, right? <laughs> well, so in like California, you mentioned they have the programs, but that program, the HBIP, um, was was a very generous program. It was eighty four million, but then it was subscribed in three hours, and like that's like Ticketmaster kind of uh, speeds, and or maybe maybe three hour three minutes is Ticketmaster, but you know how do you? Um, the other thing, the other thing that no one's talking about is that for us, we get our truck gets eighty five thousand dollars. That does not cover the incremental cost. So the customer has to go and find a second grant to cover the cost, and then they also need to work with the utility on a third grant, depending on what's required on the charging side. And so, um, it and it's you know I think we're early, right? It's, it's medium and heavy duty is really early um, in, in development and deployment. And that's not always translated on the news. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it went in three hours, but then they also have to probably go find other funding to, to figure it out. So, and you know, we work with our customers to do that and we'll continue to, to work with, with them and policymakers to figure it out. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't see Virginia having a $1.2 billion program for, right? Not in our lifetime. Uh, I mean, that would be great. We'd all be very happy and you'd be very busy. <laughs> Can I chime in on the propane side of that? Yeah. So um, before I worked with Suburban Propane, I, I worked for U-Haul International. And I head up the propane program for the past six years. I developed a program within U-Haul to for those small, you know, one or two truck fleets, so that those one or two truck fleets, if they're running propane, can sign up for a fleet account with U-Haul International, and they can go to any U-Haul location with a negotiated fuel price. And there's 1,150 U-Haul locations across North America that fill propane auto gas today. So that could help at least a starting point uh, for propane powered vehicles that, uh, that you can pick up your fuel over at U-Haul if you only have one or two, two trucks. In addition, if you're actually taking it back to a yard, of course, suburban propane can put in a, a refueling infrastructure for like little to no cost uh, to you out of pocket for the, the refueling infrastructure piece. But if you're gonna be bringing your vehicle home with you and everything and it's not going back to a yard, you could start just by going to a local U-Haul location and filling it up there. Yeah, that's a good point. And there's, with, with a lot of the propane suppliers, there are various programs for fleets where uh, they will actually cover the upfront cost of the buses or vehicles and then you know build that into the fuel cost, but also lock in fuel prices for, up to a couple of years when they're low. So there's, there are innovative solutions um, if, if needed. It's just different. It's a simpler business model right now. You know what I did learn, John might know this. So Tucker told me that there are ships running on propane. Did you guys know that? There, I've heard the same thing. I might've heard it from Tucker. Uh, 
they definitely need to put out some press releases on this. I think that that is a big deal. It, it's a big deal to replace basically bunker diesel. So it's not even like number two diesel in marine applications. And so that, that will also start seeing some additional regulation. And I've been reading The Prize, which is a great book on the history of oil. Um, and, uh, but it's just thick and I haven't finished it. Uh, you'll be you'll be happy. I'm going to show you, Alan, uh, the book that I'm finishing. Oh, there we go. There we go. This is what did you guys think about this? Uh, I've not read that yet, and I have too many books on my shelf to to knock out. But it, um, what are some of the strategies that are suggested by Mr. Gates? He. It's interesting how he kind of breaks down climate change and decarbonization and it he you know he's he simplifies it into how we move things around how we plug things in how we make things like our food and i thought it was an interesting way you know because he's probably trying to reach people that aren't so technical so i thought he did a good job of organizing a complicated subject into you know more simple sound bites, which isn't always good, right? <laughs> it's not that simple. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, that, that, in hearing more about your uh, feedback loops, uh, I imagine that in your um, broad technology-based manufacturing space that you learn a lot of lessons about uh, different methods, the technologies or components that can be uh, incorporated to make lots of existing uh, manufacturing processes or products or even um, applications, for instance, uh, defense or energy efficiency applications more efficient. So I'm interested in hearing more about, uh, I know you mentioned a lot of clients come to you with requests to uh, manufacture things but you guys are doing so much that I imagine you must have um, a vast knowledge base to be able to then go back and offer to uh, maybe some of your existing clients or even new clients. Yeah, so we're, it's, we're, we're in this unique space and that's, so that's what's driven the, the products we've developed at Clean Tech is, uh, we, we kind of take on the more specialty, lower volume custom type solutions that a large OEM, it's just not enough volume for them, right? And we have 5 million square feet of development space in Livonia. Uh, a lot of that is under like flexible manufacturing. And yeah, I mean, we've, that, that's why a lot of customers come to us, a lot of these startups, because we have the space, we have the equipment, we have the experience, and it's really expensive to do it. And the large OEMs, right, they're not gonna, they're not gonna touch it. Um, so it, it's, I mean, we, we developed some of the um, original, was it called like serial lithograph or something? You always see in Virginia, the Cox commercials, the um, print, what is it called? Where they print products? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lithograph where they, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what do they call it now? Cox calls it a fancy buzzword, like um, 3D printing. Yeah, uh, it's it? additive manufacturing or. Um, That's what we call it. It's, what is, it, they call it like 3D printing or something. But so we have a whole facility that does that. I mean, eight years ago I went and they were pr printing like heart valves or something because it was, actually yeah so um we have a whole i honestly in the last year i've started to dig in more and try to learn as much i mean we we work for bell helicopter and they go to trade shows and they want to sell their helicopters and we build um essentially uh prototypes that look exactly like the ones that would be delivered um and so yeah we have there's it's 
it's an interesting time to figure out kind of how to translate what we've been doing for 50 years mm -hmm. into the next 50 years because the right the problems we're trying to solve are slightly different and then the products that people are taught right i mean we're literally looking at every single part of the economy and how do we change the way we do things um, so do you guys on the clean tech side do you guys actively compete for government research contracts that might be granted from like uh, RPE from DOE or DOD? So this is um, probably one of the, the things I'm making the industry's team a little more uncomfortable with <laughs> because, so we have a defense side of our business and we're very familiar with those contracts and solicitations and that side of that, that business. Um, but then, all of the government grants have kind of just been dropped into our laps because another company, right? Another company goes and gets the grant and then they hire us to do a part of it because they don't have that capability or they need help. So now I'm trying to kind of force the different departments within the company to work together to go after more opportunity versus it just coming to us and it being a small engineering contract or whatever, but it's, you'll appreciate this. The company was original. I mean, Jack is a racing guy, right? He likes to win. He likes to compete. And I mean, there was a, one of his accounting guys years ago bought a Toyota truck and he paid him in yen because he was ticked that he bought a non-domestic truck. So he set up the company and all the different departments to have their own P&L and they essentially compete with one another. Mm -hmm. So now we're moving into like this big world of mobility and we're, it's, you know, so they're starting to work together. And to your point, there's so much government. It's, it's really just like, which one do we pick? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I could see in the short term future, uh, maybe medium term future, these worlds will be colliding more and more with um, uh, energy applications and alternative fuels being used in the defense space and a lot more money uh, coming out, hopefully from DOE for uh, energy research. I could see your, your worlds colliding. So you're on a, a good endeavor there inside the company. God bless you. Yeah. 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 Sometimes I feel like the Grim Reaper though, because I'm the one that delivers all the bad news too. <laughs> like, so this bill just passed or we just got kicked out of selling propane in New York city or Quebec or <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh, it's, it's a fun time. I think all of us are gonna, you know, we just got to hang on. <laughs> Are you looking for questions, Matt? Uh, I think we had a question from James Manley. Uh, he says his paratransit fleet is gas and diesel. Does propane give them more or less range per fill up? Uh, actually, so Dave Gelman did a great job of uh, talking energy density. Um, but, and, and by the way, Godzilla, um, that John mentioned, we're getting better fuel economy, which is good than um, the, the prior 6.8 engine, but um, propane is less expensive. And John, you could probably give some prices. Well, and can you also increase your range with the, with the bigger tank? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So on the, I'm trying to, I don't know if Megan's still on the paratransit tank. I remember 47 usable gallons. And then the school bus we had, we launched with 67 usable gallons. And then we went to like 90, 93 usable gallons. So a fleet could choose different tank sizes depending on how far they needed to go. Yeah, as far as uh, price per gallon, it, it's gonna vary throughout the country. And, uh, but I can tell you that it's substantially lower than gasoline. And it really depends on what type of infrastructure that we're going to be supplying and who's who's supplying what piece of it. But even after we we if we were to buy all of the infrastructure and install everything and take 
the entire, you know, piece of the infrastructure and install that on anybody's lot, uh, you're still going to be paying way less than gasoline or diesel. So, I mean, it's, it's hard for me to give a ballpark price without looking at what my costs are in those specific areas and everything. But, uh, but I mean, I can easily save, easily save a dollar a gallon compared to gasoline or diesel today, if not a dollar 50 in, in some areas, I might be able to even save $2 a gallon. Uh, it just depends on where you're at and what the current rates are for the other fuels out there. And you lock, you lock in prices too, right, John? Yes, we do. We lock in, we do fixed price agreements and, and things like that on, on a contracted buy. Yeah. Hey, hey, John, what's the comparable energy density? If you had to take uh, how many kilowatt hours of energy compared to like diesel or gas from propane? I mean, how efficient is it? for a propane motor versus a diesel, gas, or electric motor? What's the comparison? So, so there's there's a lot of it, different answers on that, depending on who you ask. Uh, but generally, it's about you get about 10 to 15% less fuel economy given the same uh, horsepower and torque. And uh, the specs that I got on Godzilla yesterday was 350 horsepower. Um, and, and you're going to get maybe, you know, again, 10 to 15% less fuel economy with that. But again, it depends on your, your driver's foot and, uh, and, and how heavy they are with it. Yeah. And, and we early on, um, we probably launched the bus a little too much horsepower because of course, you know, you didn't want it to be underpowered, but over time um, we, you know, we've kind of found the sweet spot and then we do a lot of, to your, to your point, John, we do a lot of driver training now because you do drive a propane, but it's more like a gasoline bus. Um, you know, you step on the gas and it, it responds. Um, and a lot of drivers are used to diesel where they just automatically push it all the way down. Well, I wanted to be conscious that it's about five o'clock and we have, uh, we're sort of reaching the end of the potpourri of people urgently asking questions. But I want to check around, be sure that everybody got their questions answered. Um, anybody have anything else that they'd like to share? This is a bi-weekly session. And John just dropped in the chat that up coming up next is Van Wilkins of In Charge Energy, talking about uh, a really awesome electric vehicle charging projects um, June 24th, 4 p.m. Um, any other comments or concerns? Just want to thank everybody for, for coming out here today. And Chelsea. Thank you for joining us and keeping us updated on all your great space hydrogen science uh, and everything else that's really down to earth and, and moving things forward. And so glad to be here in this world with you.